Hey everybody, I hope you're doing well. Me? <laughs> Don't mind me. I just wanted to drop in here and see if you've ever heard about something called the Tube Saw Killings. Intriguing name, right? I thought so too, and that's why I had to share this one with you guys. Honestly, this one is much more complex and convoluted than your normal cold case, but you're about to see that firsthand for yourselves. Once again, we are heading back to the 1980s, as seems to be the typical fashion here in the swamp. I don't know why, I just happen to fall into these cases all the time, and they just so happen to be from the 80s. I should also start by saying that these murders are also known as the Mineral Washington murders, as that is the location this took place. But I'm sure you can guess why people like the other name, Tube Sock Killings, a little bit more. Alright, with that all out of the way, ain't nothing to it but to do it. Let's get right into the story. Edward Smith and Kimberly Levine were both accountants who worked in Kent, Washington. They were accountants for the government, to be specific. They had moved there shortly after graduating from the University of Southeastern Massachusetts. They were engaged to be married as well, but sadly, that day would never come. On March 9th, 1985, they went for a weekend getaway in Grant County off of I-9. They had planned to explore the area's scenery and landmarks, but unfortunately, this endeavor would prove to be a fatal fatal mistake. The next day, Edward's body was found in a gravel pit. His hands were tied behind his back, his throat was slit, and his wallet was missing. Without his wallet, the police were not able to positively ID him very quickly, and he would not be identified until his employer would mark him as a missing person. A major search for Kimberly ensued, but unfortunately, the next clue in this story wouldn't be uncovered for over two weeks. That's when the couple's vehicle was found 10 miles away from where the last body was found. Investigators were able to recover a fingerprint from the vehicle. It didn't match either of the two missing people, but unfortunately, there was still no sign of Kimberly anywhere. Her skeletonized remains weren't even discovered until the next August, where she was found in some sagebrush about two miles away from where her fiance was located originally. One interesting note to consider in this particular case is that the Night Stalker was plaguing California at this very specific time, not very far away from this location. Reports of his killings made national news at the time, of course. While the cases are clearly not connected, Others have noted certain similarities and believe that it may be possible that the Night Stalker could have had something to do with this. But like I said, it's probably very unlikely. But an interesting thing to take into account here is these killings and all the subsequent killings we're going to cover could have easily been committed by somebody trying to emulate Richard Ramirez. August of 1985 is also when a couple from Tacoma, Washington Steve Harkins, and Ruth Cooper enter our story. On August 10th, the couple took their dog to Teal Lake for a weekend camping trip. But come Monday, when they failed to show up at work or contact any family members, they were subsequently reported missing by their families. Both of them worked at the same vocational school, so it was quickly noticed when they both didn't show up for work. Four days later, hikers passing through Pierce County found... Unfortunately, the remains of Harkin's body near a remote campsite. Steve, who was only 27 years old at the time, same age as your good boy Swamp Dweller here, was shot in the head. He was still inside of his sleeping bag, so it's fairly safe to say he was killed while he was asleep. Unfortunately, their dog was also found deceased nearby. But there was no sign of 42-year-old Ruth Cooper until October 26th when her dental records matched a skull found on 8th Avenue. Two days later, her purse and the rest of her body were found in the same area. They were nearly skeletonized and without clothing. A tube sock had been tied around her neck. Though the autopsy report would show that she would die from homicidal violence, a spokesperson would later say that she died from a gunshot wound to the abdomen. The police believe the tube sock was used more as a restraint rather than a way of killing somebody. Needless to say, it would be impossible not to wonder if this case would somehow interact or intertwine with the last couple that we had just talked about. But unfortunately, with no leads and no possible suspects, the police would continue to scramble. Then, in December, police were forced to contend once again with another situation that could tie in to the Cooper and Harkin disappearance and murder. Many, at the very least, believed all three of these killings were committed by the same person. On 
On December 12, 1985, Mike Reamer took his girlfriend, Diana Robertson, and their daughter, Crystal, to find a campsite near Nisqually River. Mike was an animal trapper and hoped to check some of his traps he had in the area while also looking for a nice tree to set up for Christmas. No one can be exactly sure, but sometime during the night, something went extremely and terribly wrong for the family. That same evening, customers at a Kmart in Spanaway, 30 miles away, found the couple's daughter literally just standing outside the store's entrance. Not knowing where the child came from, she was placed in foster care for two days until her grandmother saw her on the news. Only then could officials get the only clue Crystal had to offer. When the grandmother asked the child where her mother was, all she could say was, Mommy is in the trees. Now, I know this is a story a lot of people have probably heard, but they probably didn't know this was actually connected to a greater case. Unfortunately, she wasn't verbal enough to really make her point known, assuming the child's parents must be somewhere inside the forest. Both ground and air searches were conducted around the area Crystal was found. Not only was there no sign of the couple, their Red Plymouth was nowhere to be found. Mike's father believed that foul play had to be involved, as his son always carried a 22 caliber handgun with him. Police took note of this handgun, as I do believe a handgun was used in a previous one of these cases. But, unfortunately, that type of gun is quite common, so it can't really be linked too much. Diana's body wasn't discovered until many months later, half buried in snow. It was on February 18th, 1986. A motorist who stopped to walk his dog along the highway noticed her near a logging road by Washington State Route 7. Bloodhounds scoured the area for several days after, and even though Mike's Red Plymouth was found, six inches of snow ultimately stopped and slowed the search to a complete standstill. Inside the trucks, its seats were lined with blood, and investigators discovered a manila envelope inside that read, I love you, Diana on top of it. It's assumed the envelope at one time must have contained something, whether it was another note or some sort of small gift. It's honestly impossible to tell what it could have been or if it actually holds any significance. The blood was identified as being human, but due to the age and deterioration, the forensic team wasn't able to tell you exactly what type of blood, like if it was A, B, etc. Meanwhile, Diana's mother was able to identify the envelope and the handwriting on it as being Mike's, but an FBI expert was unable to confirm this. Also found in the truck was Mike's winter coat, and given the conditions at the time, it's highly unlikely he would leave his truck willingly without that jacket. Additionally, bullet casings were found a short distance away from the truck, suggesting somebody opened fire on it. But whether these shots came from a 22 or not is unknown. Diana's autopsy revealed she suffered 17 stab wounds. And just like Ruth Cooper, she was left with the tube sock tied around her neck. Since Mike's remains were not found in this endeavor, the police started to develop a theory that he was the one responsible for abandoning their child at the Kmart and killing his girlfriend and maybe even perhaps the previous homicides as well. But of course, they could not rule out definitively just yet that he was also still a victim. But of course, every avenue was worth exploring. While there admittedly wasn't a clear motive for Mike to kill his girlfriend and abandon his daughter, or, you know, kill any of the previous couples for that matter, he did have somewhat of a record with abuse. The most recent being just a few months prior to the murder. On that occasion, he was charged with domestic assault and malicious damage. He had two other previous incidents as well. In this instant, Diana's police report said, Mike kicked in her apartment door, pushed her down to the floor, and rubbed her face into the carpet like she was some sort of dog. This, of course, caused visible injuries to her face, particularly her left eye and her nose. Afterwards, she was granted a restraining order. But of course, she would ignore this when the couple would reconcile and get back together. And ultimately, they took their trip in December. With these factors in play, you can't help but think that Mike was simply on the run potentially. And that's exactly how people would view this for 22 years. But let's put a pin in Mike and Diana's story right now. We'll come back to that in a little bit. Before we talk about how our first murder was solved, I wanted to take a brief mention of a fourth couple who for some time was thought to be connected to the Tube Sock Killer. And if you look into the Tube Sock Killings, you'll probably see these names pop up a time or two. But 
over the years they have ultimately been deemed to be unconnected entirely. In 1987, Jay Cook and his girlfriend Tanya Van Kuhlenberg, I'm sorry if I'm saying that wrong, traveled from Canada to Washington to purchase some parts for Jay's father's business. They were last seen boarding the ferry in Bremerton before Tanya's body was discovered in a ditch on November 24th near Alger. She was bound, assaulted, and shot in the head while her wallet and keys were thrown away at a bus station. Much like Mike Reamer, Jay's absence put him in a not so great position in the eyes of the authorities. He was a prime suspect for his girlfriend's death, but his body would eventually be found 60 miles away, beaten and strangled. This case actually didn't see another lead until 2018, when DNA evidence was matched to two cousins, and the police went on to arrest a truck driver named William Earl Talbot. He was found guilty and is now serving two life sentences at the Washington State Penitentiary. Now, as we move forward, keep in mind that this case was not solved until just a few years ago. So, the police are still operating under the notion that these killings could potentially be connected to other sets of killings. In 1989, police were finally able to match that fingerprint found on the first couple's car to yet another truck driver named Billy Ray Ballard Jr. Months after the killings in Washington, he was arrested. But he was arrested for the abduction and murder of two Wyoming women. He immediately confessed to killing Smith and Levine, which this earned him a mandatory life sentence. Though he was still at large when the other killings happened, there is no evidence linking him to them as of yet. Then on March 26, 2011, a hiker found a big surprise. They stumbled what they thought was a vacuum cleaner cover. Curious, he lifted it only to see the remains of Mike's skull left underneath. It was within less than a mile radius of where Ruth was found. A subsequent search after this discovery led to a jawbone being found missing a few teeth, plus a pair of rubber boots that may or may not have been connected to this case. Due to the skull's deterioration and condition, it was impossible to really tell how they died, but they were able to rule out a gunshot wound to the head. With this new information, I think it's safe to say that Mike was ruled out as a suspect. But of course, some would still disagree. Due to the fact that his remains were found so close to Ruth's, but were never discovered initially, some people may think that it's possible that Mike came back at a later date and committed suicide. But I personally feel like that's unlikely. How many times have we covered stories of people going missing, people searching these areas up and down, Every nook and cranny, every left and right, no matter where you look, there is no sign of this person. Then their belongings, or these people sometime, either alive or dead, pop up right where we started. We see many missing 411 type cases like this in state parks. While yes, he most certainly was violent toward Diana. It's not the level of violence suggesting that he is capable of three or more murders. Not only that, but if he did pre-plan Diana's murder, he did a pretty piss poor job at it. Especially since in this scenario, it wouldn't be his first rodeo, so to speak. It would have been imperative, if not necessary, to kill his girlfriend before dropping off their child at the Kmart. Given the amount of blood found on the seat, it would be really risky to make that drive there and back anyway with the person's body bleeding out like that. It would be far more likely that a second vehicle is somehow involved here. And not to mention, it doesn't really make much of any sense that somebody who would have such a guilty conscience to come all the way back to the crime scene and then kill themselves a mile away, it just doesn't seem very logical. Why would they do this in the first place? Doesn't it seem more likely that he would want to be right next to her, right in the same spot as her, to end his life with her if he was that remorseful of killing her? It doesn't make any sense that he'd be a mile away, if you get what I'm saying here. Plus, don't forget that couple from 1987. That hasn't been solved yet either. As far as the police were concerned, all this did was simply rule out Mike as a suspect in the case. It's hard to guess what may have even happened here. Truly, all we can do is just guess. And even then, we may never really know. No matter which theory prevails in the end, there are so many insane coincidences in this case. Assuming the tube sock killer only killed the two couples where the tube socks were involved, 
The Smith and Levine case were both a coincidence in timing and action. The actual violence seems to just match up so well. Could multiple people have been inspired, consciously or subconsciously, by Richard Ramirez the Night Stalker? To me, it seems so strange that such thorough searches were conducted in each one of these cases, and yet nothing was ever found until just before a new murder. That's where this whole serial killer thing starts to come in and make sense, right? It's almost as if someone were waiting and knew where to place the bodies where people would find them right before they were ready to strike a new victim. Maybe that's just another coincidence in this entire web of convolution. We don't know. I guess that's entirely the point here. Could the person who killed Steve and Rhonda be a copycat of Ballard? Perhaps adding their signature to it. Steve and Mike also share similarities. Both were known to be outdoorsmen and maintained relationships with significant age gaps. While these facts may not seem like much alone, one must admit that there are so many weird coincidences that we can't really rule out anything when it comes to this one. Whether innocent or guilty, Mike certainly carried a handgun with the same caliber. He had a history of violence, was incredibly familiar with the area, and more damning than almost anything, no other murders were carried out after his death. Did he kill Stephen Ronda and develop a guilty conscience after killing Diana and abandoning his daughter? Was it an accident that he felt compelled to cover up by mimicking a well-known murder case in the area? Seriously, at this point, I'm just asking what you guys think. I'd love to know in the comments. Please let me know. Well, and that's another tale told here in the swamp, my friends. I really appreciate you guys checking out this style of storytelling. I know it's incredibly different from what I normally do on here, but it's something that I really do want to work towards in the future, and I think it's a lot of fun. I have a lot of fun putting these together. If you enjoyed this story, please be sure to hit that like button, elbow it in the face, make sure it feels it, subscribe to the channel if you're new, it really helps us grow. If you're listening to this on Apple Podcast or Spotify, be sure to give us a five-star rating over there as it helps us grow on those platforms. If you have a story that you'd like to suggest, be sure to throw it down in the comments or join us on Reddit at r slash thedarkswamp. You can also send in your personal scary stories to be shared on the podcast at swampdweller.net. I'd love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. I really appreciate you guys for all the support. If you can comment down below letting me know your thoughts on this case, I'd really appreciate it. If you made it all the way to the end, be sure to comment the code word to confuse anybody who didn't, which is blue rectangle. Thank you guys so much. Be sure to join me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, all that good stuff, and I'll see you soon with another creepy episode. <laughs>